Hello and welcome to Captain's Dry Dock and in a dry dock today we're organising my drawers. Not those types of drawers, this. Let's make it real. No, don't minimise the screen. Hear me out. I know it's a boring subject about drawer organisation, but trust me, I'm trying to plan to make this drawer as accessible as possible because we all have a common issue. We throw stuff in our drawers and it takes us ages to retrieve the thing that we put in there in the first place, let alone even finding it. And so I want to make it look actually cool as well. <laughs> Step one, the important step, I need a drawer in the first place. Now I went online and I could not find a suitable size drawer for my Ikea desk. Now you can get plenty of little ones, but I wouldn't be able to fit all my stuff in. So I wanted a big, big drawer. However, I did find one on Amazon. However, the company that makes that and sells that are based in the USA and it just would cost too much money to bring it over the Atlantic Ocean. So I just had to make one myself. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail how I made the drawer because it's very straightforward. It's just a box made out of MDF and plywood, all stuck together, screwed together for strength. And the only thing that I needed, which was specialized, was the runners either side to get that nice smooth action in and out from the desk, which made it really usable. And those I got from Amazon. The link is down below if you want to get a pair yourself. First, I lay out only the key tools that I regularly use. This is where I have to be ruthless and I make two categories. Items used daily or at least a few times a week and items that are used a few times a month or very rarely. So what happens to items that are seldom used? It goes into the attic where it's lost forever. And then years later, you buy exactly the same thing because you forgot that you had it in the first place because it's in the attic. Because, as we all know, the attic is our version of the black hole. Ah, it's sucking me in! Well, not quite. Not in the attic anyway, but perhaps an easily accessible box in the same room as a desk. Now that I've chosen the tools, I need to take a photo of them so I can use them as reference and make the modular pieces. I do this on a mat with grid lines, so I know the photos are taken square on, and also a fair distance away, so to avoid distortion by perspective. Before I import those photos into Fusion 360, I make a mock-up of the drawer, making sure the dimensions are exact, as this will dictate the size of the modules, and I'll know what I can fit. Only then I can import the photos and calibrate the size by picking this pen as reference that will then make the entire photo one-to-one -one scale. I roughly trace the outside of each item, making sure I left enough space so it wasn't a tight fit. I could do tighter, but you always have to think ahead when designing, because if the tolerances are too tight, then it'll be a pain in your ass, and it'll feel like a jigsaw puzzle when putting the item back in its location, and then you won't bother at all. Then all I need to do is use the tools of extruding and filleting, which basically makes it an object, and the filleting makes it all nice at the edges. All those hours of playing Tetris in the 1990s is coming up trumps because this has turned out really, really well. And I know there may be a few questions out there saying, actually, say if your priorities change, you don't use that particular tool anymore. Well, that's a good point. That's why it's in components, meaning it's interchangeable. Let's just say one day I wake up and I don't want to use my tweezers anymore. I hardly use them. Well, I'll just take that out, redesign something else that goes in its place, the same footprint, and pop that in. Bob's your uncle, Fanny's your aunt. It's future proofed. The design element is all done and now it's time to print. So I've opened up my Cura, which is a slicing software for my 3D printer, and I popped in one of the components and it fits on the bed very well. So it can be printed in one go. Let's go printing. For this project, I'm going to be using my Ender Free filament printer with white filament, not just because it's a colour or shade that I like, but it hides a multitude of sins. If you have 3D filament printed before, you will know you get the texture of a vinyl record because of the layer lines. It takes forever to sand it down, paint it and make it look half decent. Well, I can't be asked to do that at the moment, so I'm going to be using white because it reflects light in a different way and it looks absolutely fine after I've printed it out.
It's now been a week and I'm really happy how this turned out and it's been really, really useful as well. And in fact, this whole project emphasizes the fact that anyone can actually design and make something for themselves that's actually practical for their needs, that they can't find something online to do it for them. And it's so easy to do. In fact, all the programs that I showed in this episode are free to download. In fact, the links are down below in the descriptions. And other than the 3D printer, which is your only big cost, after that, it's super cheap to print out. That roll of white filament you saw there only cost me 14 quid. And in fact, I probably only use about four to five pounds worth to actually make all the components you see here today. I really hope you enjoyed this episode today. It was really useful for me to actually do this project for myself, but hopefully you get something from it. If you've got any questions whatsoever, leave a comment down below, give a like and subscribe if you haven't already done so, and I would really appreciate that. In the meantime, my name's John Child. This is my really cool draw, and I'll see you on the next episode on Captain's Dry Dock. You take care. <laughs>